Hello, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I mean, we are having a class on telling ourselves the truth. Uh, we have a way of deceiving ourselves. The Bible says that there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. There's a way that seems right. We think it's right. We, we tell ourselves it, it's okay. Go ahead and do this. It, this is the way we should go. And we find out in the end, it wasn't the right way to go at all. You know, our thoughts get us into all kinds of trouble. And the consequences of our thoughts get us into trouble and cause other people to have some troubles too. Truth is what is real. It's reality. It's objective. Truth is when reality and our thoughts line up together. That's what truth, truth is reality. You know, if you drink a deadly poison and you think, well, it's going to be okay, it's not. You're going to die, no matter what you think, because that's the reality of it all. Uh, we have gotten into our culture to having this two-tier way of thinking. We have this two-story thinking that we have. Uh, on the base is the reality of things. There's the truth, the objective truth. This is, this is what is real. But then on the upper story, we tell ourselves what is really real. This is our truth. This is our reality. But unless those line up together, unless what we're thinking and what really is true line up together, we are going to have problems. They've got a match. Uh, we're deceived to believe that what's really important is what we think. We have our own truth. We have our own reality, and, and that's just not true. And many issues today are because we, we have been deceived. We, we have these issues today. We have these problems today in our culture and society and in our own lives because of the way we think. And that's why the Bible tells us over and over, like in Romans 12 too, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed in your thinking so that you might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, be transformed in our thinking. Don't be conformed to the world. See, too often our thinking is conformed by our culture, to our culture, to the way the world thinks. And we want to be like everyone else. And so we want this conformity. We want to be like them. And what the Bible tells us over and over, hey, look, you're living in a fallen world. You're fallen people in a fallen world and your minds are corrupt. You need to transform the way you think, have a newness of thinking, to focus on the way God wants you to think. Our thinking causes us so many problems. And, and one of the biggest issues is how we look at people who are different from us. And I want to talk about that today. How do we look at people who are different from us? The term we use in our culture the most to describe this is racism. Can you tell yourself the truth about racism? Uh, we need to have a biblical understanding of race, a biblical conviction of race, a conviction that is strong enough to change our hearts and to change our behaviors and our outlook. We need to have a godly worldview when it comes to race. And let's start off with, with the basics. And that is that we are all descendant from Adam. Everyone is a descendant of Adam. In Acts 17, verse 26, Paul says that from one blood, God caused all the nations to come. Uh, Acts 17, verse 26, he says, And he made from one man, one blood, one flesh, that is, Every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. God has made us all from one. Uh, everyone, no matter what color you are, what nationality you are, you have the same blood. You know, no matter who you are, if you cut them, 
they bleed red. Our blood is pretty similar. You can get a blood transfusion from any person of color, any person who has a, a different nationality than yours, because we really come from one blood. Eve is the mother of all. Some years back, I did some genealogical studies. I don't know if you ever did the genealogy to find out, you know, who your ancestors were. And, and you go back, and you go back, and you go back, and you find out, okay, here's my grandparents, and they, they had this many kids. And, and, you know, after a while, you realize, wow, I, I have so many cousins that I wouldn't even know if I run into them in the street somewhere. I wouldn't even know them because there's so many of them. And after a while, you know, the, you start off with just parents and then grandparents and the, the, it's an inverted V, you know, I mean, a, a V. It, it just comes to, gets bigger and bigger and there's so many of them. And what you find out is it's bigger than you think because it all goes back to one man and one woman, Adam, Eve, were all descendants of them. Uh, there's one race divided by nations, tribes, and tongues. Not races, but race. One of the great passages in the Bible is from the book of Revelation, where it tells us God's goal. In Revelation chapter 5, for instance, it says here, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In chapter uh, 7, verse 9, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. You know one of the things that's missing in the Bible? is the word race. You never see race in the Bible. You see nations and peoples and tongues, but uh, no race. Uh, God looks at people differently than we do. He doesn't distinguish us by colors. He distinguishes us by nationalities, by the language we speak, by the tribe we come from. Our minds are so corrupted that we begin to look at everyone who is different than us with suspicion. Our minds are corrupted. Evolution has had a powerful impact on the world and on Christians as well. And I think it has corrupted our minds. You know, when Darwin first came out with his Origin of the Species, the subtitle of the book is Persever uh, Preservation of Favorite Races. Preservation of favored races. Uh, for instance, the uh, Australian, Australian Aborigine, he was to be uh, deemed as not as evolved. Uh, they were looked at as not quite equal in humanity as the rest of the world. And, and you take a look at different people and you say, well, they're just not as evolved as the rest. Uh, which has led to all kinds of problems in the world. Nazi eugenics. You know, the Nazis, they were known for their racism and they're known for their, their hatred of other races. And this came from eugenics, this idea of, of evolution. Hitler looked at his nation and he saw the weakness in the German people and he says it's because they were, there's been an inf infusion of degenerate elements an infusion of degenerate elements. And so they went on a course of selective breeding. Take people with Nordic and Aryan characteristics and have them breed with one another. Eugenics had been used with cattle and crops. And now, why not with people? We'll make this perfect race. We'll make this, this great race of people. And then there's life unworthy. There's people who aren't worthy of life. And he listed prisoners and degenerates and a whole list of others until he came to even the, those with disabilities, those with Down syndromes, those who are unworthy of life. And he put many of them to death, some went under sterilization. And then we know of the mass murderers, millions and millions and millions of Jews and gypsies and others were, were put to death in concentration camps because their life was not as valuable as other lives. 
They had not evolved to the point we are, or they had evolved in a degenerate way, degenerate manner. And some, in the, even the United States, had favored eugenics. We have been so influenced by this evolutionary concept of racism, of races. Let me ask you this question. How many generations after Adam was created, how many generations later, how long was it until people started to turn this white, pinkish, pale color? Now, that might shock you if you're a white person, because you might be thinking, well, I thought Adam was white. I asked the same <laughs> same question when I have an uh, audience of mostly people of color. How long do you think it was before uh, Adam w became this dark, ashen, uh, darker color? Well, the, because the problem is we are so... F racism is, is based upon pride. And we think that, you know, the ultimate is who we are. A racism is rooted in pride and there's a suspicion that comes with sin. And... Um, and we see it all around. Uh, you, you know, uh, th this is happening. In Genesis, the 11th chapter, you have the Tower of Babel and the confusion of languages. Sin causes corruption and competition and conflict. And when you have this change in languages, what happens is people tend to marry people they can understand, people who speak their same language. In fact, people who look like us, we tend to marry. And with this change, there was the narrowing of the gene pool. And so, uh, if you spoke a certain language, you started meeting people that, who spoke the same language, they were from the same family, they had the same physical characteristics as you did. And some of those characteristics we see today, one of them is skin color. Uh, a skin color. Uh, we see a variety of skin colors. Now, really, really, in reality, there's only one skin color. Uh, it's just the matter of how much melanin you have. Uh, if you have a lot of melanin, you're going to be a, a darker color. If you don't have any melanin, you're going to be lighter color. Uh, you know, I, I almost, I'm so white, I have no color. I'm almost translucent. Uh, when I get in the sun, I don't tan, I, I burn and turn dark white. I mean, I have no melanin at all. I have no pigmentation in my skin at all. And if I marry somebody else with little pigmentation, our kids will probably come out with little pigmentation themselves. And so if you have a lot of, of pigmentation, you have a lot of melanin, the person you marry has a lot of it, your children will have a lot of it too. And so we end up with people who are families of darker skinned people, families of lighter skinned people. Uh, it's the same thing with eyes. You know, we say of Asians that they have almond-shaped eyes. Well, what they have is an extra fold of fat in their eyes. Now, the reality is everyone has fat around their eyes. But uh, you, you start passing on these characteristics to your children until it finally becomes a characteristic that's passed on from generation to generation. And there are other characteristics too, like earlobes. And other facial features, we don't usually distinguish by earlobes. We say, oh man, if you got the wrong shaped earlobes, I don't want much to do with you. I'm suspicious of you. But skin color is so obvious. Eye shapes are so obvious. And, and so uh, we, we begin to be suspicious of those who are different than us. And most of the differences really aren't, aren't what we call... Uh, no physical features at all. The, really, the, the most difference is, 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 is cultural uh, because we have a shared history. We have shared beliefs. And it, it's a shame that we don't appreciate other people's cultures more than we do. Uh, one of the, the things that uh, we should be sharing is our, our culture. When I lived in Southern Oregon, there were members in the church that I went to that were members of the Cow Creek Indians. I remember going to their powwows. I remember uh, hearing about their their ancestors. I uh, hearing about their stories. Uh, one of the funerals and that I, I did for one of the ladies from the tribe, and I hope this doesn't sound strange, but she was buried in one of the most beautiful beaded dresses 
that you'll ever see. It was part of their culture, this Native American culture, these beaded dresses that were just gorgeous. We went to China and visited people and one of the things we enjoyed was their culture, their, their, their food was especially uh, wonderful, but also their architecture and, and the other things that they shared with one another. And we got to Mexico and uh, we have these cultural differences and uh, th they should bring a, a fullness into our lives. But we need to relate to others, especially as equals, as family, not by race. Uh, you know, let me ask, what race are you? What nationality are you? I actually get asked that all the time. I just filled out a questionnaire for my COVID vaccination. They want to know, you know, what, what color are you? What race are you? What nationality are you? And uh, I always check the box that says, uh, it's none of your business. Uh, I, I don't want to specify. One, one of the things, if you know history, you know, how is it that the Nazis were able to round up these Jewish people so rapidly? Well, one of the things is they had all filled out questionnaires at some time in their life that identified them as Jewish people. They'd get on a train, show us your papers. The paper said, I'm Jewish. They nabbed them. I mean, they had nowhere to go. There was no place for them to hide. Uh, we don't need to identify ourselves by, by race or nationality. We are one blood. We are of equal value to God. Uh, we need to see each other as God sees us. In 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, <clears throat> verse 7, when God was speaking with Samuel about who he was going to choose uh, before he chose uh, David, he says, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for God sees not as a man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's what we have to do. Stop looking at the outward appearance and look at people's heart. Uh, you know, Martin Luther had a, king, had, had a dream. Martin Luther King had a dream uh, that people wouldn't be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, by the content of their heart. Uh, there has been a, a call that seems to try to group everyone into groups by color. Here's people of color. Here's people uh, that, are, that are white. Here are people who are Asian. We we want to pigeonhole everybody and keep them in their little separate groups. And uh, But we're equal value. What, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to always bring out the differences in us rather than seeing the humanity in us all? Now, then, I I'm, as a white person, I have white friends. I have a lot, a lot of white people. And uh, there are some white people that you'll find out that you just don't like. Now, I try to love them, but I, I just don't like them. And I have some black friends, too. And I, I, I like most of them, but there are some you find out you just don't like. Now, does that make me racist because I don't like them? No, because of their character, because of something. And we, we need to look at people as individuals, not as groups of black people or people of color, not as groups of white people or, or Asians or, or Indians or Native Americans or whatever they might be. You know, Jesus tried to reach across ethnic and gender divisions. In John, the fourth chapter, he spoke to a Samaritan woman. And she even asked him, why are you being a Jew? Speak to me as a Samaritan and as a man, speak to me as a woman. And Jesus didn't look at people according to their ethnic background, according to their gender, according to their color. In fact, in Acts 8th chapter, there's the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. He's an Ethiopian. We know Ethiopians are from Africa. Uh, what color was this fellow? It doesn't say, does it? Uh, because that's not the important part, but I can assume that he's a person of color. Americans are so racially programmed, particularly to look at skin color. Uh, our culture has such racist roots. And uh, my friends of color, I've heard their stories and they've had to endure tremendous prejudice at times. And it's just terrible what they what they've had to endure. And, uh, you know, there seems like we can do a better job 
especially in our policing. <laughs> there seems to be two groups of people that uh, need to always have good judgment, uh, with pilots and police. Uh, we don't want a pilot that makes a mistake. It's too deadly. We don't want police to make mistakes either. That's deadly. We want people who can look at other people, not as the, as the color of their skin, but, but the character of their of their heart. Or, uh, we've got to tell ourselves the truth about racism. Uh, you know, in the protests I hear, it's almost like, well, everybody who's different than me is a racist. Uh, we look under every rock for racist. Uh, Disney is racist. And Dr. Seuss is racist. And food products are racist. It's about finding racism in others. I think we need to tell ourselves the truth about racism. That sometimes, maybe I'm the one who looks at people who are different than me in a way I shouldn't. Uh, we need to ask ourselves and ask ourselves the truth and tell the truth. Do I? Have I ever looked at someone differently because of the color of their skin or because of their facial features or because of their hairstyle or because of the accent of their voice or because of the music they like or by their poverty or even by their wealth? or by the clothes they wear, or by the food they eat. We need to tell ourselves the truth. There's one race. There's one blood. We are all in this together. We are in a, we're fallen people in a fallen world. Our minds have been corrupted. We need to allow God to renew our thinking. Not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our of our minds and start looking at people, especially people who are different from us, in a, a new way. You know, to love God, but to love our neighbor as well. I want to end with a reading from the book of James. James seems to say it really well, I think. In James, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9, he says, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and convicted by the law as transgressors. Look, we are all of equal value in the sight of God. And we should all be of equal value in the sight of one another. Be sure you tell yourself the truth about racism. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.